Eddie Offit, lead mechanic for the Tucker Corporation, pushed the Tucker 48 past 90 miles per hour as the brick racetrack at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway chewed up the car's tires. More than 150,000 people had written to Tucker, begging to know how they could buy a car that the Securities and Exchange Commission didn't believe even existed. Offit knew the car was real, though. He was currently guiding it around turn three at the brickyard. As the sun rose high above the Indiana cornfields surrounding the speedway, Offit took the next corner low on the track, and as he did, the Tucker's 334 cubic inch flat six motor stalled out. The rear engine rear wheel drive car hopped a bit on the bricks before the backside swung around. He struggled for control and the all new right rear tubeless tire exploded. The steering wheel spun and he fought hard as the car headed for the wall. Quick thinking got him aimed at the infield where he wound up sideways for a brief second before flipping three times. The windshield popped out and eventually the car stopped rolling and landed on its wheels. Offit pulled himself out of the wreckage as his team rushed to his rescue. They soon discovered the car had stalled because a tech had dumped aviation fuel in the car instead of standard gas. Offit was battered and bruised but not really injured and the car started right back up with the correct fuel. While Offit thought of the crash as a setback, Preston Tucker saw the crash as an opportunity. Nothing Team Tucker had done caused the wreck, and the car had rolled three times and left the occupant and vehicle fairly unscathed. Aside from the bruises, it was a win-win. How did the Tucker Corporation of the 1940s develop one of the most innovative cars of the time, then fail to get it into the hands of consumers? Just what innovations did Tucker pack into his futuristic 48? How did an innovative sales process land him in hot water? Why did federal judges fight to block Tucker from not only releasing his cars to the public, but to even build them at all? Today on Past Gas, we're taking a trip into the Wayback Machine to have a look at the world that could have been if one dog had succeeded at building the car of his dreams. Past Gas Podcast. It's about cars, it's not about ports. You guys ever rolled a car before? Yes. Oh, you rolled the No, I didn't I didn't roll a car. I tipped a car. Oh yeah. In the the Peel P50. Peel P50. Did you you got all scratched up, right? Yeah. All things considered, it was a pretty mild accident. Yeah, it was like two miles per hour. <laughs> yeah, I was going like, yeah, two miles an hour. Like when it's when it started tipping, I was like, I can't believe this. <laughs> <laughs> Made for a great opening for a video, that's for sure. Yeah, certainly. That was fun video. Uh, so I just looked up the difference between aviation fuel and gasoline. Uh-huh. Which one makes you loopier? Oh, and you huff it? Yeah, which one's a cleaner high? Uh, <laughs> I'd, I'd have to say aviation fuel. Yeah, I bet. But it's maybe harder to get if you're not near an airfield. But anyways, higher octane rating, still leaded. Mm. Still, oh, so they're they're flying these planes over our heads. Yeah, chemtrails. Their leaded exhaust is raining down on us still. Yeah, into our water supply, onto our dogs, into the salmon population. <sighs> That's and then we kiss was, our dogs on the head and get the lead in our mouth. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about microplastics this morning. Oh no. And how they're probably like bouncing around our bloodstream. You know, like they're in our blood, right? For yeah. sure. So Tef in our, we got Teflon in our blood. Everyone on this that earth means has Teflon. We're in our, it's in our brains too. Oh yeah, yeah for sure. That makes my brain work quicker because the yeah, Teflon. The, it's slippier. The, the neurons can fire more efficiently. Okay. You know what? I'm actually all about this. All right. Thanks for, thanks for changing my perspective, Joe. Hello. Welcome to Past Gas. This is not a neurological studies podcast Neur this neurological is, but it is a very neuro heavy very brainy oh yeah. stuff oh happens yeah. on this podcast it's probably i don't know we're like number two automotive podcast i think we're probably number one brain yeah oh yeah number one brain cast in the world replace magazines with books replace music with podcasts replace music with podcasts yeah Fill your life with just a, a stream of information. You have no hope of retaining all of it 
I don't remember anything that I talk about on the show. Uh, hello. Yeah. Welcome back to Pass Gas again. I'm your host, Nolan Sykes. Replace friends with acquaintances. Your network is your net worth, dude. That's some Sigma grind set stuff right there. We're on that sig on a Sigma grind set this week. I'm Nolan Sykes, joined as always by my co-hosts. Got Joe Weber. Sigma. <laughs> and James Pumphrey. Beta, baby, beta. <laughs> I got that beta energy. And yeah, I mean, weird, weird energy this morning. Why? I don't know. I, you know, uh, the last episode we did, we recorded on, um, what was it? Monday afternoon. That uh-huh. was weird and energy I, for sure. I felt good though. I felt like I, my brain was awake and I could read better. Yeah. You couldn't read today at all. I, I, anytime <laughs> we do this show, like I, you know, I, I have to stumble over sentences. Uh, I have to re- start rereading sentences cause yeah, I mess man. it up. Like literally to, I said to myself, I was like, what the, f- <laughs> cause you can't read today. I can't in the morning, but on Monday afternoons, I can, uh, anyway, let's talk about, uh, the Tucker 48 Preston Tucker was born in Capic, Michigan on a peppermint farm, Ooh. 50 miles North of Detroit, just after the turn of the century. Fresh. <laughs> His father, Shirley Tucker, Tucker, oh, boo. Shirley Tucker <laughs> was a railroad engineer that died of appendicitis just a few short years after Preston was born. Dang. His mother, Lucille, moved the family to Lincoln Park. Hell yeah. Lincoln, Lincoln Park, a suburb of Detroit, after the death of her husband to raise them alone. Because there was no other man of the house and 1914 not being a especially safety conscious time to be alive, Tucker found himself driving at the ripe age of 11. By 1920, the Tucker family had hit hard times, and Lucille brought in a half dozen lodgers to live with them. <laughs> that was a weird way of saying Are you I having a stroke? I t- I'm telling you, I can't read in the morning. This should be apparent. Half, half a dozen ledgers. <laughs> A half dozen <laughs> lodgers to live with them. So you got, you got Paul, uh, six Paul Bunyans. I, I put this one on Jake. Just say six, you pretentious. I know, <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. Make it easy for me to read, please. Six. It's six. <laughs> Their days were to half, half a dodger lodgers. Half a lodger dodgers. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, their days are typically occupied uh, with young Preston grilling them endlessly about what kind of car they drove. <laughs> Six dudes in this house. <laughs> this little just kid is just out. bugging them. <laughs> I gotta go chop down a tree, kid. <laughs> this is the same. Uh, they're not loggers. They're lodgers. They're lodgers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but there's a. It's not mutually exclu- exclusive. They could be loggers and lodgers. They could be logger lodgers. They could be half a dodger logger. <laughs> this, this is the same origin story as Forrest Gump <laughs> so far. I don't want to make any assumptions, but follow the money. And follow the money, dude. Follow the money. When Preston wasn't asking anyone who would listen about their car preferences, he'd hang out around gas stations <laughs> and bother the mechanics with rapid fire questions about their work. Preston even managed to land a gig as an errand boy at Cadillac headquarters, where he worked directly under D. McCall White, the Scottish executive who helped design Caddy's first V8 engine. White had him running so hard between divisions and offices that Preston laced up some roller skates and became known as that kid riding roller skates around the office. And that's when he got the nickname Preston Lacey. (laughs) Nice. And it was all fun and games until he whipped around a corner and slammed into his own boss at full speed. <laughs> they both tumbled to the ground, and Preston was sent packing. Dude, you're the one who's making this kid ride around in roller skates. All right? <laughs> the chickens have come home to roost, as far as I'm concerned. I don't believe this. The roller skating story? Yeah, I, I think that this is a thing that Preston Tucker made up. Or that he was like, yeah, I was like, hell, I used to work for D. Watt, uh, blah, 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 Cadillac. I used to, he used to have me running around so much. I tied up some roller skates till one day, I swear, I came around the corner, smacked right into him, and he sent me packing. I don't even believe he ever worked at Cadillac. But the thing is, <laughs> our files got mixed up, and I got the plans for the new V8. 
So when I got fired, I started my own company. Yeah, this guy's a con man. <laughs> okay. With his Cadillac days behind him, Preston started flipping cars. He'd buy low, polish, and fix any issues and sell high, baby. It was easier said than done. But where so many others had failed, Tucker succeeded. He sold his way to nicer and nicer cars, all while putting cash in his pocket for himself and his family. Young Preston had a specific preference for his cars, too. He liked them to go fast. It's like a red paperclip kind of situation. Mm -hmm. Preston wasn't satisfied with the mediocre speeds his flipped cars were making, and the car modding culture hadn't caught on yet. So he found a way to fulfill his need for speed. In the 1920s, the only people souping up their vehicles were the local police. As soon as Preston figured this out, he was sold. Preston lied about his age. He was 19 and you had to be 21. And he went off to cop school. There they showed him the gun stuff, the handcuff stuff, and whatever else you need to learn to be a cop, like the racist stuff, <laughs> uh, before handing young Preston uh, the keys to a 74 cubic inch V-twin Harley Davidson police motorcycle and, ported and pointed him towards the Detroit River. The location of his assigned patrol. <laughs> he got river patrol. For got river patrol motorcycle. on a motorcycle. <laughs> to jet ski. You make sure the water doesn't come out of this river. Yeah. And wear your roller skates. <laughs> <laughs> his plans were to just race up and down the banks of the river all day on the motorcycle. <laughs> yeah. 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 Of course. Unfortunately, it was 1922 and prohibition was straight up popping. Preston had no idea that the Detroit River was a common trade route for bootleggers. This uh, put a crimp in Preston's plans right quick, and he was forced into doing some good old-fashioned police enforcing. He collared a couple of rum runners and bragged to his mother about it, but she said, no way, too dangerous. <laughs> and after a few months of Preston's tales of chasing bootleggers, his mom went downtown and ratted him out to the chief of police, Spilling the beans about his actual age. Oh, if man. this is real, then the 20s are insane. <laughs> like, what a different time. Now we have to buy property in the metaverse. Back then, your mom could be like, hey, listen, my son lied. He's not old enough to be a cop. And they're like, man, <laughs> damn. But he's good. Yeah. He was the best cop I ever had. Keeps calling all these bootleggers for us. <laughs> Uh, the chief of police booted Preston with a wink and a nod, and he left the force with a promise to come back when he was older. Preston was hopelessly obsessed with cars and found his way to the Ford plant where he bolted together Model T bits all day long. He soon got bored with the repetitive nature of his gig and asked for a transfer to a different part of the assembly line. But alas, that job was also too boring. Preston then found himself turning wrenches at a gas station, passing the time this guy's had more jobs than I have, and he's 21 years old. I don't believe it. <laughs> I don't think it's that unreasonable, dude. Yeah, people started when they were like eight in the 20s. I don't believe that he was a good cop. I believe he maybe arrested one person and then told his mom about it, and then that yeah. that's what happened. He's had like five different positions at Ford. Now, <laughs> then he was a cop. Cadillac. He worked at Cadillac, got fired for roller skating. I mean, he was an intern, basically. <laughs> Uh-huh. He was an errand boy over there. Preston found himself turning wrenches at a gas station, passing the time until his 21st birthday when he could go back to being a bike cop. And when he did, he quickly discovered that he was just as good at the police work part of policing and quickly caught a bank robber. He was dressed in stripes and had a bag with a dollar sign on it. <laughs> he then busted an auto thief and collared a gaggle of moonshiners. But Preston's heart wasn't in policing. It was in driving fast and not having to do any actual work. He spent long nights driving around frozen Detroit streets, simply enjoying the ride. Preston had a problem, though. Detroit was cold. And so was his patrol car. The police cars of the 1920s weren't equipped with heaters, so Preston got innovative, setting a pattern he'd live out for the rest of his life. He rolled up to the garage for the police station and stuck out an acetylene torch and went to work cutting a big hole in the firewall so the engine heat 
would keep him toasty on those frigid Detroit nights. On those frigid Detroit nights. (laughs) (laughs) Isn't that like, wouldn't there be some carbon monoxide sneaking in? It'd probably be some fumes that weren't too good for you, but you know, it's the twenties. That stuff didn't really affect you. You know, you just died at 55 and that, that was expected. We're full of plastic. Yeah. We got Teflon in my brains. Can't read good. (laughs) How about try a cracking book? (laughs) (laughs) I was trying to figure out how you phrased that last week and why it was so (laughs) funny. Cutting this hole works too. He was warm and other officers decided they wanted to mod their cars with a new custom Tucker heating system, uh, AKA a hole. (laughs) But Eternal Affairs didn't take too kindly to officers burning holes in cruisers without getting permission first. Preston was promptly banned from driving any police vehicle. No. Bumped down to foot patrol. A car enthusiast's worst nightmare. You can't even wear roller skates, Preston. (laughs) You got to get those steps, though. It's very important. He had Heelys. (laughs) (laughs) But then his toes got cold and he cut holes in his Heelys. (laughs) Thanks to Good Chop for sponsoring this episode of Pass Gas. Good Chop is America's online butcher. With Good Chop, you can get a flexible monthly subscription plan for high quality American meat and seafood. You can choose the medium or large plan and enjoy your favorite cuts of beef, chicken, pork, and seafood. It's delivered flash frozen for freshness and sealed with dry ice inside insulated box. One cool thing about Good Chop is that they have the highest quality products you can find. They offer convenient contact-free delivery right to your doorstep. There's something for everyone. There's mouthwatering ribeyes, flavorful T-bones, wild-caught salmon, tender chicken breasts, whatever you want. They got it. And if you have a problem with anything at any point, they have a 100% money-back guarantee. Good Chop sources only the good stuff, which is why they feel confident about their 100% money-back guarantee. You love Good Chop or you get your money back. From my experience, Good Chop is super easy to get exactly the meat that you want. It's delivered fresh and on time. We ordered a big box from Good Chop and we got all the meat that we ordered. It was delicious. It was fresh. We got delicious ribeyes. We got wild caught salmon. It was great. So go to goodchop.com slash gas100 and use code gas100 to get $100 off your first three boxes. Once again, go to goodchop.com slash gas100, use the code gas100 and you get $100 off your first three boxes. Good Chop, America's online butcher. Big thanks to BetterHelp for sponsoring this episode of Pass Gas. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. Relationships take work. A lot of us will just drop anything to go help someone we care about. We'll go out of our way to treat other people well. But how often do we give ourselves the same treatment? This month, BetterHelp Online Therapy wants to remind you to take care of your most important relationship, the one you have with yourself. Whether it's hitting the gym, making time for your haircut, or even trying online therapy, you are your greatest asset. So invest the time and effort into yourself like you do for other people. I really like how easy BetterHelp makes going to therapy. You don't have to go into a building. You don't have to get in your car. There's a lot of things that stress people out and that you shouldn't have to feel alone about it. I think it's really important that everyone does therapy. BetterHelp is online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy and you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. Give it a try and see why over 2 million people have used BetterHelp online therapy. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp and Past Gas by Donut Media listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash passgas. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P.com slash passgas. Thanks, BetterHelp. Preston hated walking. (laughs) So he handed over his badge and gun and followed his passion straight to a car dealership. At this point, he was eight years old. (laughs) Specifically, uh, Mitchell Dulian's Studebaker dealership where he quickly proved to be a car-selling savant, of course. Preston would parade (laughs) Studebakers through downtown Hamtramck, a portion of Detroit, and then set up on a street corner like an old-time snake oil salesman, pushing the features and reliability of the Studebakers. Together, Dulane and Preston became the best-selling dealership in Detroit. For the next decade, Preston and his family hopped between dealerships from Buffalo to Memphis, where he made some serious cashola. Eventually, he found himself at a Packard dealership in Indianapolis, 
While selling now defunct Packards, Preston started making visits to the famous Brickyard. Mm. While poking around the Indy 500 garages, Preston met Harry Miller, one of the great minds in automotive engineering, as well as boating. He helped engineer the first ever outboard boat motor with his friend, Ole Evanrood. Oh, Evanrood. Evanrood. Don't invite Evan to the party, Evanrood. Evanrood, man. <laughs> Maybe try crack book sometime. Maybe try crack open a book sometime. <laughs> <laughs> Harry Miller was a winner and an innovator. Indy cars built by Miller won nine Indy 500s in the 1920s. During that time, he also built the first aluminum pistons and developed the aluminum alloys we use in engines today. His engines delivered the goods and brought Indy racing to all new speeds throughout the roaring 20s. From 1920 to 1929, Miller engines won an utterly dominant 79% of U.S. car races. But while he was a winning engineer, he was garbage at selling his own work. Each year that passed saw him closer and closer to being homeless, even while his engines propelled champions to the podium. Enter Preston Tucker. On roller skates. With no time to waste, Preston started a PR blitz around Miller's innovations. By 1931, newspapers were referring to Preston as Miller's manager, and they had news to sell. One big headline from the time was Miller builds for the Speedway plans four wheel drive racer <laughs> to appear at Indianapolis. Up until that point, the cars had all been rear wheel drive and Miller had done some tinkering with a front wheel drive car. He thought he can combine the two and have a big win. And guess what? He did. Why did you keep me waiting for so long? <laughs> <laughs> After a few years, Preston convinced Henry Ford to get behind his escapades with Miller and fund a racing team. Ford and Miller Tucker collaborated to bring 10 cars to the Indy 500 the next year. The agreement was Miller would prep the cars using the Ford parts bin and Preston would lead the charge. Together, they managed to get four Miller built cars to qualify for around $75,000. While it wasn't the original 10, it was still a major feat for a team to deliver four cars from scratch to the starting line at the Indy 500. But Miller's reputation for winning didn't carry over with the Ford vehicles. The best showing of the day was 16th place. And at the end of the day, Ford paid to mothball the cars in a deep, dark warehouse. The experience put such a bad taste in Henry Ford's mouth that he put the kibosh on any future racing projects while he was still alive. Luckily, a few years later, he died, and by 1952, <laughs> Ford was back to building race cars. But Miller and Preston didn't have the deep pockets that Henry Ford's pants offered. They had to work for a living, even with war on the horizon. I feel like Henry Ford would have, like, secret little swastikas, like, stitched into the inlining of his pants. Mm-hmm. I feel like his pockets would go down to his knees. <laughs> oh, so he could scratch his knees. I get it. Uh -huh. That's a good invention. After leaving Indianapolis, Tucker knew war was coming, and he envisioned a race car tank okay. zipping around European battlefields, smiting enemies, and saving the day. He and his old friend Harry Miller got to work sketching out the entirely custom Tucker Tiger tank. He and Miller cobbled together an impressive prototype. It weighed 10,000 pounds, and the custom 175-horsepower Packard V12 motor pushed the monster to 114 miles an hour. Whoa. What? The same top speed as a 9090 Miata. Off-road, the Tiger tank would bump around at a shocking 78 miles per hour. That's faster than the Jeep or a Beetle. Both uh, classically fast cars there. Well, there's two cars that were around back then. But the most fascinating component sat atop the vehicle, namely a geodesic dome hat with a 37 millimeter anti-aircraft gun turret poking out of it, capable of firing 120 rounds per minute. That's two a second for my math peeps. <laughs> Mounted to the sides of the gun dome were two 50 caliber machine guns. Dang, dude, it is loud as <laughs> there. Yeah. <laughs> 
The Tiger Tank was so speedy and nimble, Preston said it would chase airplanes around the countryside and shower hot death upon them in ways that fixed oh, anti-aircraft guns couldn't compete with. Hot death. Hot, hot death. death. Hot <laughs> death. That's some hot death. The military almost bought the whole thing too, but it was 1939. They were already working on Jeep designs and they didn't need a bunch of light trucks crashing into each other all over European battlegrounds. <laughs> but they did like the turret on top and they wanted to learn more. The Tucker turret used electric motors to swing the gun around, a big step forward that allowed for faster tracking of aircraft and less fatigue to the gunner. But Tucker's design was too slow. The government asked for it to be made faster and was willing to pay a premium to make it happen. Tucker toiled on the design and had a hard time getting parts to make the turret faster, but at the end of the day, the military soured on the venture. In the end, not a single turret was ordered. Around that time, Harry Miller had fallen ill and passed away, leaving Preston looking for a new project. What do you guys think of turret for a boy's name? Uh, <laughs> it's a little feminine. Turret? Yeah. Come on, turret. Get off the, get off the it car. It just sounds like you're saying toilet in a funny voice. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I fell in the turret. <laughs> Jeremiah, you get back in that bathroom and you wipe off that turret. <laughs> You're disgusting. Stop standing so far away when you pee. McGruber, your turret is disgusting. <laughs> McGruber, your toilet is disgusting. I think we're on a, a like a month long roll of you saying that during an episode. It's <laughs> the funniest line in a movie ever. <laughs> And I'm pretty sure that it was improvised by Ryan Philippi, <laughs> Reese Witherspoon's ex-husband. Oh, I'm s sad things didn't work out for them. Me too. I'm not. More Ryan Felipe for us. <laughs> it's Philippi. It's Philippi. Philippi. Ryan Philippi. Felipe. It might be Felipe. Uh Past gas audience, hit us up. Past gas at donutmedia.com. Is it Philippi or Felipe? Or Philippe. Or Philippe. It's definitely not Philippe. And who do you, who's your favorite early 2000s blonde, curly haired sweetheart? Are you Justin Timberlake or Ryan Felipe? I'm a Joshua Jackson guy. Oh. Ooh, Pacey. I think I'm a Heath Ledger guy. Heath Ooh, Ledger. He's, yeah, yeah. He's troubled. 10 things boy. I hate about you. Oh, yeah. His mouth. <laughs> yeah dude <laughs> alright well after the passing of Harry Miller it didn't take long for Preston to find an all new direction he returned to Detroit and founded the Tucker Corporation during World War II the military had commandeered US car factories and used them to pump out war machines this left a several year gap where no new cars were coming out and left the American people making do with their aging wheels Americans were desperate for new cars and their tastes had changed after spending a few years bouncing around Europe in Jeeps and motorcycles, the guys returning from war wanted something a little spicier to get behind the wheel of. Four-ton, 40-horsepower sedans weren't going to cut it anymore. Preston got to work designing an all-new car from scratch, using the latest advances in auto technology, especially those from the auto racing world. He figured he was starting from an advantage because the big three were burdened with recovering from the war effort while he could be a little scrappy startup and launch without overhead or existing legal issues in place. Preston made some very wise decisions and great hires in the early days of the company. He brought in famed designers George Lawson, Alex Tremulus, and Reed Weimeister to sketch out his future. The prototype design was streamlined and groundbreaking. It was everything the public wanted. Preston started a media frenzy, and his car went full-on viral before it even started ordering parts. And it had some big promises to deliver on. The Tucker Torpedo, later called the Tucker 48, to avoid evoking a war that was still fresh in consumers' minds, yeah. was hands down one of the most ambitious cars ever designed. A total pioneer in engineering and safety features. The 48 utilized a rear engine, rear-wheel drive setup, built around a perimeter frame that offered almost modern levels of race car crash protection to the passenger vehicle. I think it looks sick. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't, I don't mind this. It's very of the time. 
It's got three headlights. Three we headlights. can make it home <laughs> with three <laughs> headlights. Yeah, of course you can. That's a lot of headlights. <laughs> yeah, one of them, uh, it's like the BMWs are, it's a lot of cars have it now, but as you, would, it was connected to the steering rack. Oh, yeah. So when you'd go around a, tur- a corner, oh. it would uh, move. <laughs> That's so ahead of its time. A lot of stuff. I think if I think if you keep reading, we're gonna hear uh, there's a lot of stuff ahead of its time. And it's crazy to think that he was only 11 years old at this time. <laughs> All right. So Tucker was played by Jeff Bridges. Okay. Yeah. He had an advantage in over the big three because they were building war machines. Okay. Whoa. Jeff Bridges was in Iron Man mm-hmm. with War Machine. No, he died before War Machine. Uh, Nolan, follow the money. <laughs> I'm following the money. I see the connection's there. Yeah. I love Jeff Bridges. He he drank white Russians. And where did they use a lot of tanks? Russia. And what is Russia? Snow. And what color is snow? White. Damn, follow the money. Harry White. <laughs> Harry White. Damn, dude. I think we just blew the... Freaking top off of something. <laughs> Preston put some thought into where all the instruments were placed. Something that didn't happen much back then. The parking brake even had a key so it could be locked to prevent theft. It was all very well thought out. Inside the cockpit, Team Tucker had relocated the glove compartment to the doors to create what they called the crash chamber. For the first time in a passenger car, the windshield was shatterproof and designed to pop out during an accident. And the dashboard was fully padded and secured, all inside a custom-built roll cage integrated with the roof. That's pretty cool. I like this car. The more I read about this, the more I like it. All that safety was necessary because the Tucker 48 was fast. Preston originally wanted to build a 589 cubic inch flat six with hemispherical combustion chambers, fuel injection, and overhead valves Triggered by oil pressure instead of a cam. Holy crap. This, I mean, that thing would sound insane. A huge displacement flat six like that would be pretty sick. It's an it's a airplane motor. The design called for an oil pressure distributor mounted in line with the ignition distributor to deliver timed oil pressure bursts to open the valves. The motor had enormous aluminum pistons with magnesium plating. The massive boxer motor was designed to idle at 100 RPM and cruise at 250 to 1,200 RPM through direct drive torque converters working every wheel instead of the transmission. That's crazy. (laughs) It would push 200 horsepower and a stump pulling 450 foot-pounds of torque at just 1,800 RPM. What? That's crazy. It's like almost like a diesel. It's an airplane engine. Like, that's what airplane engines are. He keeps saying that. What is an airplane? (laughs) Oh, I forgot. I'm time traveling. (laughs) I'm doing a podcast before the invention of airplanes. (laughs) At 60 miles per hour, the motor was designed to run at 1,000 RPM, which would essentially give it an insanely long lifespan. Yeah, you're not stressing that thing out. No, you're not. Six prototypes of this engine were built, and one of them was installed in the first prototype just in time for demo day. The Tucker was not without its problems, though. Two suspension arms snapped under the car's weight, and the engine had lots of little gremlins to deal with. The team ironed them out, but the 589 remained deafeningly loud, even at idle. Preston had a band on hand and ordered them to blast their music at 11, but that didn't help. Also, since the starter required a jump to turn the motor over, they couldn't kill the engine during the whole demo or it wouldn't start back up. So it's as loud as loud as the whole time. That's funny. As they're trying to do their pitches. That's hilarious. Just for reference, that 589 cubic inches is nine and a half liters. That's a big boy. That's enormous. Aren't aren't the uh the flat sixes in the GT3, the Porsche GT3 Are is four uh, liter, that's right? a four liter, right? Yeah. Damn, that's huge. That's like three Fagos. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I th- isn't there a story that like this was at an auto show and they fired up the car while 
I think Ford was giving their presentation on stage <laughs> and it's just like <laughs> super loud in the background and everyone's like, what is going on? I'm pretty sure that was pretty sure that happened. Uh, okay. When the Tekker 48 finally made it up to the platform, the radiator had boiled over and started steaming. One of the most influential newspaper columnists of the time wrote a scathing article about how the 48 was a total fraud that couldn't even go in reverse. The writer called out all the little issues with the prototype and sullied the reputation of Tucker in general, even if they were all prototype issues. A flood of negative press came in after that. More problems popped up, and the Tucker wound up needing a whole new engine. Preston signed off on a much more reasonable 334 cubic inch flat six that made 166 horsepower. That's good. Yeah. And he also had to rework the suspension, settling on a rubber four-wheel independent suspension design similar to his past race car designs with Miller. But they were so stiff, you had to pull the rear fenders to get the wheels off. Before any production could get started, Preston's best business idea caused some problems for Team Tucker. (laughs) After the war, the big three had more demand than vehicles, and they too launched waiting lists. But they decided veterans of the Great War would jump the top of the line and take priority. Preston launched what he called the Tucker Accessories Program, where if you bought a bunch of custom accessories, you jump to the front of the line. But the government, specifically the Securities and Exchange Commission, did not like this one bit. Tucker responded by taking the SEC on head first through a series of full page ads that declared his goals of building a new car were in peril because of politics at the SEC. But it was too little too late. Dealerships started lawyering up and sending letters to Preston to get their money back. Now, the SEC was not messing around. They came in hard and fast, taking control of the corporation and forcing a reorganization. On June 10th, 1949, after a long trial, Preston and six other executives at Tucker Corp. were indicted on 25 counts of mail fraud, five counts of violating SEC regulations, and a single count to defraud. Preston maintained that the charges were <laughs> and said this was a chance for him to show his side of the story and win over the American public. But trials don't really work like that. Tucker Corp got slapped around for a few weeks in the courtroom while every publication from Collier's to Reader's Digest printed leaked statements and documents from the SEC report that made Preston Tucker look like a con man. Man, this sucks. It seems like he really has just like good intentions and got dragged you think he's a con man for sure during the trial the government accused preston tucker of never intending to produce any actual cars they brought disgruntled former tucker employees onto the stand where they swore on a bible that preston's team would have to reinstall early suspension designs before they got them working properly you want your employees to be gruntled at all times you don't want them to ever become disgruntled you want them nice and gruntled yeah you got to keep them gruntled (laughs) <laughs> they also outlined how Tucker used junkyard parts to build prototypes and did anything it took to create working models, which I 100% believe. Uh, Tucker's current employees took the sand and exclaimed, hogwash. <laughs> That's how building a car works. You just throw stuff together until you get a working model, then improve upon it. The SEC, for its part, wouldn't budge. They accused Tucker Corp of never making a real car, and they brought up a dealer that Tucker had partnered with to sell the cars. Under cross-examination, said dealer revealed that he'd lost $28,000 investing in Tucker. The defense also asked the dealer what kind of car he drove, and it turned out to be an early Tucker 48 prototype that he daily drove with 38,000 miles on it and was as smooth as the day that Preston Tucker had given to him. He was pretty gruntled with that car. Yeah, he was He's disgruntled about losing the cash, but he's gruntled about the car. (laughs) While the trial was underway, these non-existent Tucker 48s were starting to become very, very real. The Tucker factory had completed a total of 50 fully operational 48s while the trial went on and on and on. They even drove them around town for everyone to see. Finally, the SEC called up their chief accountant, Joseph Turnbull, who was asked about Tucker Financials. Now, it turns out he'd taken in more than $28 million and spent less than $4 million on research and development. 
Turnbull claimed Tucker took $500,000 into his own wallet and had no intention of delivering an actual 48. What a rat. <clears throat> the defense asked Turnbull for any evidence of this, and he said that he had none. Then, uh, when asked if he was suggesting any fraud occurred, Turnbull said no. Finally, in an absolute shutdown of the SEC's accusations, Tucker's lawyers called shenanigans and said that either the Tucker Corporation intended to defraud everyone and build no cars, or he was in the process of building the cars right now. What? He said he called the bluff. He said, if, if we're defrauding, then we're not building cars. Do you want to check and see if we're building cars? The jury sat in silence. Then, lead defense attorney Daniel Glasser invited anyone in the courtroom to take a ride in one of the eight Tucker 48s parked outside in front of the courthouse. Mic drop. Boom, baby. That's a little mic drop. Boom. Eh, Boom. That's a little mic drop. And Clarence's parents have a real nice marriage. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> big thanks to peloton for sponsoring this episode of past gas i can speak from experience that it's really hard to motivate yourself to exercise and stay healthy and promote good habits one of the easiest ways to do that is with the peloton and peloton is pushing you further with so much new on the peloton bike and peloton bike plus there's new classes there's new music there's new ways to keep your workouts fun and motivating you may think Peloton is just about the bikes, but there's actually boxing, which is super cool. Peloton is stepping into the ring with its newest discipline, no gloves needed. Discover a fast, furious, and fun workout with Peloton instructors in your corner. Even if you've never boxed before, like me, these classes will have you working up a sweat while working on the fundamentals of form, footwork, and fun combos that will keep you on your toes. I love switching out my workouts. I get bored really easily. The good thing about Peloton is that they don't just do bike stuff. You can do a lot of different workouts that keep it fun and interesting like boxing and if you're someone like me who needs like motivating music all the time for your workouts to stay interested peloton offers new artist series music selections Peloton is adding fun new artist series classes. Work out to the music of a single artist for an entire class, which is super cool. From your favorite hits to the deep cuts, there are over a hundred artist series to choose from. Find your favorite music and turn your next workout into a concert. Visit OnePeloton.com to learn more. That's O-N-E-P-E-L-O-T-O-N.com. Within a day of deliberations, the jury returned a not guilty verdict for all of the accused. Well, Preston won the day the Tucker Corp was ruined. They were buried in debt, buried in lawsuits from angry Tucker lawyers, and they'd lost the factory where they were making the cars. Preston Tucker took it in stride, though. It took a while for his reputation to rebound, but it did come back. Meanwhile, the government auctioned off all of his assets. He was allowed to keep a single Tucker 48 as a symbol of his success, as well as his failures and battles. Bit of a Pyrrhic victory there. Yeah. Tucker worked to develop other cars, a zippy-looking Roadster, and some different designs. He tried to launch a new car company in Brazil, but it never went anywhere. And when he returned from his travels, Preston found himself weak and unable to work. Not long after, he succumbed to lung cancer. Oh, Damn. Man. Otto Kerner Jr., the U.S. attorney who so aggressively led the charge against Preston, found himself in the newspapers a few years later when he was convicted of 17 counts of bribery, conspiracy, perjury, and stock fraud. Whoa. Yeah, so who's the fraud now? Yeah, well, Preston Tucker will always be remembered as an innovative car builder who took on an entire industry. Otto Kerner will always be remembered as the first federal appellate judge in history to be jailed for his crimes. There's a lesson to be had here. It's not to run afoul of the government agency that regulates your company, but even the government can't take away the fact that Preston Tucker lived one of the most interesting automobile lives <laughs> of the 20th century. <laughs> so yeah, big, big, long life full of a bunch of crazy things. No, short life. He was 13 when he died. <laughs> So uh, 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 Tucker was able to build about uh, 51 of these cars, and apparently there's 47 of these still around. Still around. Whoa. Yeah. One of them's at the Peterson, right? Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. So you guys are saying that you don't really like the design? No, I like it. It's all right. 
Shut up, Nolan. It's great. You're you're just jealous because your car is dumb. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, these would look way better with patina. Yeah, they're no, not even rusty. I like it. I like it. I didn't say it was bad. You're disgruntled with it. Yeah, I'm you're quite disgruntled. gruntled, Joe. I'm quite gruntled. Thank you very much. How about you grundle my grundle? Okay. <laughs> uh, Thomas just said that they're each car is worth about two to three million dollars now. So maybe you sell Dang. your Chrysler and take up a side yeah. job, and you can get one. Yeah, I'll get on that Sigma grind set. <laughs> um, <laughs> Save my pinch my pennies. <laughs> yeah, passive income, right? Yeah, dude. Freaking passive income. Grundle and get that grundle money. All right, we got some got some mail here. Tyler sent us an email. Hey guys, during your episode on John Force, you're talking about the 64 Mercury Comet drag car, and James made a comment that cars back then were body on chassis. I'd like to make a correction because I've had the pleasure of owning a 64 Mercury Comet, picture included, with my 75 Dart in the background. A Comet actually shares a chassis with the Ford Falcon, and interestingly, the Ford Mustang, which were unibody in construction, and thus there is no chassis. In restoring these cars, they have to be put on what is called a rotisserie so thank you very much tyler thank tyler. you tyler you got me yeah you got you you got him yeah uh we implore anyone to get us with yeah. corrections <laughs> and uh these your car is very sick i like this uh this comment is dope so if you'd like to hit us up with any corrections or uh you know comments suggestions whatever hit us up at pass at donutmedia.com and we might read your email on the air. Yeah. So let's let's up. focus on correcting Nolan. <laughs> <laughs> I, I also say a lot of <laughs> that's not true. I recently realized that I'm sitting in front of a computer and I can fact check anything that I say, despite just rambling stuff. So please correct me. Hey, it happens. Mistakes happen. Please um, correct me, Daddy. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. All right, so follow my co-hosts on all social media. Follow Joe at Joe G. Weber. Follow James at James Pumphrey. Uh, follow me at Nolan J. Sykes if you'd like. Big thank you to our producers this week, Thomas Willett and Gavin Kinsell, as always. And, and our, our writer, writer, Jacob Desjardins. Desjardins, what's up, man? Uh, thank you guys for listening. Um, see you next week.